In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome to you all this morning to St Nicholas Church and uh, to our service of Holy Communion for the sixth Sunday of Easter. We'll be reflecting uh, 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 mainly in our, the sermon today on the reading, the first reading, the reading from Acts, but in our second reading is part of the text in which Jesus commands uh, his disciples to, to love one another. And so uh, the opening song which uh, the band are going to do uh, is a new commandment, so we'll be doing that in a moment. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Is risen indeed. Alleluia. Loving God, we have come to worship you. Help us to pray to you in faith, to sing your praise with gratitude, and to listen to your word with eagerness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ died to sin once for all, and now he lives to God. Let us renew our resolve to have done with all that is evil, and confess our sins in penitence and faith. We have lived by our own strength, and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes, as faithless and not believing. In your mercy forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. God, our Redeemer, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that, as by his death he has recalled us to life, so by his continual presence in us, he may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The reading is taken from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verses 44 to 48. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Would you please stand for the gospel? Alleluia, alleluia, I am the first and the last, says the Lord, and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Alleluia. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, 
to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. May the words of my mouth and thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> some point in the early 1970s, when I was about 11, around 1972 or 1973, I think it must have been, we were at a family gathering, and I think it was a great aunt who was telling the story of having been to see the doctor. Uh, my mind is slightly hazy about whether it was the GP or in hospital, but the next bit is quite clear in my memory. Her appointment had gone well, Treatment was successful, and she obviously felt that the problem was resolved. He was an Indian doctor, she said, and added with a little note of surprise in her voice, but he was very good. <laughs> now, although it was the early 70s and Bernard Manning was still on mainstream television, I remember being slightly bothered by this. This man was a qualified doctor working for the NHS, so of course he should be competent. However, her story suggested that it had been surprising that an Indian doctor should be so capable. Now, with some prejudices seeming to be more openly expressed again these days, I've thought back to that moment, and I realised that although it may be wince at the time, let alone now, I wonder if what was actually going on under the surface was a moment of revelation. My great aunt was delighted to discover that medical competence was not reserved to one nationality or ethnicity, and if she had carried any prejudice before, it had certainly been challenged by this good experience. It was one of those moments, perhaps, when someone realised that they are just like us. Now that came back to me, reading the story of Peter visiting the house of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. We actually had an earlier bit of this story at uh, Midweek Communion, and we have the conclusion here today. We need to remember that this is very, very early in the progress of the preaching of the Gospel. Cornelius is a Roman centurion. He is an officer of the occupying army, and he is about to become the first Gentile to have the good news of Jesus preached to him. According to Acts, he was charitable, a God-fearer, and seemingly carried some respect. But the Jewish community in which he lived would have many issues with him, quite apart from him being the occupying army, which would be bad enough. Romans worshipped various gods and even held the emperor in a kind of divine respect. For Jews who steadfastly worshipped one God, that would be difficult, and for most of them blasphemous. The Romans didn't follow the Jewish food laws, which I'm sure devout Jews would find repulsive. They also didn't keep the Sabbath, which would have been offensive. Although we do have some evidence in the Gospels that the Romans accommodated the Sabbath to some extent. If you remember, they wanted the crucifixion over before the Sabbath began. So it's no surprise that when God calls Peter to go round to Cornelius' house, when he turns up, one of the first things Peter says is this. This is just before the reading we had in from verse 28. You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Impure and unclean was the norm. But in a vision, Peter had had it shown to him that he should not uh, 
you regard the, gen the Gentile uh, people he was going to go and see in that way. But we need to appreciate that the personal, communal and psychological barriers that needed to be crossed to go into that house were substantial. This is an extraordinary moment in Christian history, actually. And remarkably, some other believers from Joppa went with Peter. Cornelius, meanwhile, had been expecting Peter and asks to hear what God wishes to tell him. Now, in the short episode we heard today, from the end of the story, I think we have a moment a bit like uh, my great aunt uh, experienced. It was a moment of realisation that they are just like us. <laughs> and the evidence for that was the Holy Spirit. So let's take it step by step. First of all, Peter tells the story of Jesus. He outlines who Jesus is and what he did. I'll, I'll quote it because I think it's really important. He says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on the cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. First thing I noticed was that what facilitated the Holy Spirit to come into the lives of those Gentile Romans was telling the story of Jesus. He told the story of Jesus to all who were gathered in the house, to use the phrase that Acts gives us. Now, it may be that at some point in your Christian experience you've been to some sort of gathering where, uh, which has been very much emphasising the Holy Spirit. I've been to meetings uh, with the Holy Spirit and we've gone into a prayer time and the person leading it seemed to be suggesting that uh, uh, there's some technique by which one can summon the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit isn't a pet cat that needs coaxing out of the bushes. The Holy Spirit isn't a spirit that we summon by some kind of weird sayings. The Holy Spirit is God's presence and he blows where he wills. And I must admit I find uh, some of those kinds of, that kind of approach problematic for that reason. The telling the story of Jesus enabled the Holy Spirit to come into these people's lives. That's what made the difference. It wasn't some clever technique. It was telling the story. That should not surprise us. Because encountering Jesus helps us to understand who the Spirit is and therefore be open to him. And in a sort of circular thing, the Holy Spirit helps us to know Jesus. Second, the coming of the Spirit had an impact. Now in this case, Acts records speaking in tongues and praising God as the symptoms. But all kinds of other evidence might have been noted. Courage to speak, generosity of spirit, compassion, reconciliation, a deeper hunger to learn more about Jesus from the scriptures, a sense of purpose, direction or vocation. All of those are littered across the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit is at work. We have lit gift, uh, lists of gifts of the Spirit, of course, in the New Testament, but none of them claim to be exhaustive. What is testified is that the Holy Spirit always has an impact, always has an effect. There are symptoms of suffering from an experience of the Holy Spirit. Third, and this goes back to my original story, the Holy Spirit is poured out on everyone equally. Now, ironically, Peter had already preached a sermon on this in Acts chapter 3, but I don't know if he was listening. <laughs> he preached on the pro prophecy of the prophet Joel, who, who, who expected the Spirit to be given to everyone. But here, along with the other followers of Jesus who were devout Jews, he sees God showing no discrimination. The Spirit comes on the Gentiles, the Romans, uh, the non-Jews that were there, just as he had come on the Jewish disciples on the day of Pentecost. And so they're baptised, and a moment of revelation occurs. They are 
just like us. <laughs> God shows no partiality. Now, before I trained for the ministry, I worked in the church as a lay assistant uh, in uh, Holy Trinity, Cambridge, actually, for a couple of years. And during that time, I met a man called David Armstrong. He was a Presbyterian minister from Northern Ireland during the height of the troubles at the end of the 70s and into the, the 80s. He'd done pioneering work building a relationship with the Roman Catholic Church across the road from him. He went over and wished them Merry Christmas at the end of Midnight Mass. And in 1984, you can imagine that all hell broke loose <laughs> as a consequence in Northern Ireland. But David felt and was convinced it was the right thing to do. And credit to a core of his congregation, they backed him, ironically, uh, in due course, his church was full. But it led to abuse. It led to death threats and more. I remember David once telling me that he used to get little model coffins pushed through his door. They'd get death threats and, uh, uh, and other things. He remembers in being in a crowd once where people were jostling outside the church and various people were there. He realised someone was urinating on his shoes. When he was when ordained into the Church of England, special branch searched the church first. Although it was an extraordinary occasion, the Irish ambassador read the lesson, Mary O'Hara played the harp. I don't know how he made it and found all these connections. <laughs> and wonderfully, a whole group of the Roman Catholic congregation, along with their priest, who just sat there in an alb and knelt humbly to receive a blessing at Holy Communion, um, uh, came, to the, came to his licensing. At the end of the service, we sang, Thine be the glory. The Anglicans, of course, sang Thine be the glory in good Church of England fashion. They sang, Thine be the glory. The Roman Catholics sang, Thine be the glory. And all the Church of England people went, <laughs> <laughs> We didn't know Catholics did that. It was another moment, actually, of revelation. Uh, David, as a result of his reconciling work, managed to find himself in all sorts of places, including being in the room when the Anglo-Irish Agreement was signed. I don't know how he might wangle that, but anyway. If you met him, he's just an everyday, everyday chap from, <laughs> from Northern Ireland. Uh, you wouldn't believe the, the, the people he knew. But David had had the same prejudices about Catholics as many of his fellow Protestants until he found himself in a context where Roman Catholics and Protestants were gathered at Belfast Anglican Cathedral. The speaker talked about the Holy Spirit, and David realised as the meeting continued that around him, from both sides of that terrible divide in Northern Ireland, were people who had had the same common experience of the Spirit. It was a moment just like Cornelius' house, a moment when David realised that they, are just like us because God shows no partiality. And I think the best of that charismatic movement, as it was called in the 1980s, was breaking down barriers between Christian denominations and the prejudices which we inherited from what we call the Reformation. So my prayer, as I anticipate Pentecost, is that the Holy Spirit would challenge any prejudices I may have that I may seek to look beyond not just the usual identifiers, you know, the, the ones that are listed in law, gender, uh, ethnicity, nationality, sexual orientation, that sort of thing. There are other prejudices that we manage to invent that aren't covered by the law. People who live in council estates compared with people who don't. People who vote remain or people who vote to leave. People who vote to conservative and people who vote to lay. But we find all sorts of ways of grouping people and demonising them. And you can see it in the press. And I think one of the sad things over the last few years in politics is it just seems to have become much more tribal, with people not able to listen to each other or talk to each other uh, across some of those divisions. But I pray that any divisions where I might see some people as them and others as us, in that divisive sense, might be challenged. I might not think I would rule anyone out of God's reach, but I wonder if I do. 
So as we approach Pentecost, let's pray that God would help us to see all people as he sees them. We may find ourselves pleasantly surprised to find that they are actually just like us. And God shows no partiality. Amen. We continue to use some of the shorter uh, prayers and, and options at the moment because we're actually keeping the length of the service down and preachers sometimes go on too long. So uh, we, we, we're using the, the, continuing to use the creed we use at baptism services today. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe, we believe, believe and trust, trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe we and trust, trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe we believe and trust, trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This, this is, is our faith. faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So would you please sit or kneel for our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Faithful God, we thank you for the gift of your word and for our ministers who explain its meaning to us. Your Son, Jesus Christ, commanded us to love one another in the same way that you love us. We ask for the strength and resolve to follow this commandment so that we readily love and serve our neighbours, recognising that in serving them, we are also serving you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, we pray for your church and for our Christian family worshipping around the world in so, so many different settings, including those worshipping at home online. We recognise our good fortune that we are able to worship freely and ask for your protection for all those persecuted around the world as a result of their Christian faith. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Eternal God, we thank you that you created our world and ask, ask you to forgive us for not taking care of it properly. Humans are knowingly putting this planet's future <coughs> at risk by our actions and we pray that governments around the world take action to try to reverse some of the harm already done and to prevent further damage. Help us to play our own small part in this too. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. The peoples of your world live in uncertain times, particularly due to the, to the COVID pandemic. We are sorry that we sometimes forget our own good fortune and can feel dissatisfied when in reality we have many reasons to be thankful. We must be encouraged that in this country the rates of coronavirus infection are now comparatively low and pray that this situation is not jeopardised as the restrictions are eased still further. We thank you for those who have skills as scientists and health workers now making a spectacular success of the UK vaccination programme. We raise up to you other countries who are much less fortunate than ourselves right now. In particular, we think of the desperate situation in India and ask that the international aid effort to supply vital oxygen and vaccines will bring relief to many. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, help us to find time to pray regularly for those we know who are suffering in body, mind or spirit, and in doing so, be part of the healing ministry of your church. We ask that you draw close to all those suffering physical or mental health problems relating to the pandemic, and also those struggling with grief brought about by the loss of a loved one. Of course, we continue to pray 
for both the close and wider family of Riley Ketley. And we particularly ask for your help for his many teenage friends as they work through their feelings about what happened. We lift to you those offering support, including their families, the pastoral teams at the secondary schools, and the youth workers at the Cherry Tree Centre. We also pray for a family who used to be regular members of our congregation. Some of them have been in hospital and are now in recovery. And we ask that you surround them with your love and that they know your presence with them through this troubled time. In a moment of silence, I invite you to pray for just one person that you know who is in particular need of God's help today. Lord, in your mercy. Finally, Father, we pray for our church as we approach the APCS and prepare to review the past year and the many, many challenges it has brought. More importantly, as we also turn to the future, we ask that you inspire us with a renewed vision of your purposes for us, for us in this local community. We ask that by your Holy Spirit, you show each one of us the part you want us to play in the life of this church. Many of us remember our friend and former vicar, Jonathan Evans, who we believe wrote the following prayer, known to us as the St. Nicholas Prayer. O Lord, increase our church in spiritual depth, in numbers of worshippers and in necessary finance. May we all experience your love and understand your will and purpose for us. Help us each to know our part and faithfully to do that part. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour. The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks to our praise. It is always right to give you thanks, God our Creator, loving and faithful, holy and strong. You made us and the whole universe and filled your world with life. You sent your Son to live among us, Jesus our Saviour, Mary's child. He suffered on the cross. He died to save us from our sins. He rose in glory from the dead. You send your spirit to bring new life to the world and fill us with power from our mind. And so we join the angels to celebrate and sing. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. O Sabbath and us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. O Sabbath. Father, on the night before he died, Jesus shared a meal with his friends. He took bread and thanked you. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After the meal, Jesus took a cup of wine. He thanked you and gave it to them, saying, Drink this all of you. This is my blood, the new promise of God's unfailing love. Do this to remember. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ has Christ will come again. Father, as we bring this bread and wine and remember his death and resurrection, send your Holy Spirit. 
that we who share these gifts may be fed by Christ's body and his blood. Pour your spirit on us that we may love one another, work for the healing of the earth, and share the good news of Jesus as we wait for his coming in glory. For honour and praise belong to you, Father, with Jesus, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. The Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Hallelujah, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. May the body and blood of Christ keep us all. In eternal life. Amen. God our Father, whose Son Jesus Christ gives the water of eternal life, may we thirst for you, the spring of life and source of goodness, through him who is alive and reigns now and forever. Amen. We pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. God, who through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ has given us the victory, give you joy and peace in your faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.